The ZTE penalty was based on uh, a group of employees that the U.S. identified who were involved in Iran and North Korea. And then ZTE is supposed to um, demote them, penalize them, not give them bonuses, and ZTE didn't do that. But that's kind of an assumption that it's like a Western company and you've got a bunch of rogue employees. You know, I, I, I think there's, it's pretty clear that it's just a policy of the government to use these companies to go into those countries. So it was kind of an impossible situation. It also, if you cut off ZTE and you destroy ZTE, a company that big because they can't get components from American companies, you're proving the government's point that they're very vulnerable on foreign technology. So it was probably a mistake to go so strong when commerce did it, because how are you going to really carry that out? So what kind of deal did Trump do? And you know, it was she, she, we don't know. We don't know. It could be um, help on North Korea. It could be they won't go after the farmers. Who knows? We have to wait and see. The big talk on Fox News and in the White House is that Trump will get the Nobel Peace Prize, and that's his goal. And so I imagine uh, Mr. Xi in China can use that to say, you want our help on North Korea, then um, we have to moderate some behaviors on trade. And I think that this president will be most most focused on what's good for him as a person. That's the problem um, with this president. He's very transactional. And, you know, the, the, the Chinese leadership looks at him and uh, that, you know, the art of the deal, let's just cut some deals. And then you don't have to change anything structural in the relationship. And so if we do cut a deal right now, let's say a month or two from now, this all kind of settles down and China agrees to buy more things and, and um, allow more market access and the U.S. backs off on some things and we come to a, um, some, some kind of a, um, an end point. That's going to be very temporary because if we don't address the structural issues between the two countries, especially made in China 2025, the U.S. looks at this as an existential threat to our innovation and technology base. And that's what has to be addressed. And uh, it's very difficult that you think that you're going to make China change. How do you make China change on 2025? I think we can't make China change, but we can change the interface on how the U.S. deals with those policies. And if, a, if we're smart in dealing with those policies, that might then incentivize China to back off a bit and not be so aggressive because China deserves to build its own technology center, especially chips. 50% of the world's chips are consumed here, 80, 90% are imported. But when you come up with a policy that's about domination, you know, it's about domination, it's about eliminating foreign companies and, and beating them globally using all of the tools of the state and all of the money of the state, well, then you've just put a red flag in front of a bull. You know, China always talks win-win, maybe we should actually try a few of those. Last year when we were there and we brought up Made in China 2025, especially on Capitol Hill, people were, many were not familiar with it. Um, this year, everybody knew what it was. Uh, and they may have known it at different levels of detail, but they all knew what it was. It was a very threatening technology policy aimed at all the technologies of the future. And so um, that has all of political Washington wor worked up, administration and the Congress. Um, and so this is not going to go away with a, a deal that, you know, changes a few trade numbers. It might be set aside for a very short period of time, but until we can address that structural problem, um, we're not going to have a, a smooth relationship with China. And Europe is even more loaded up on this than the U.S. actually. Treasury Secretary uh, Mnuchin I think just wants to cut a deal and settle things down and please the president by getting something that at least looks like it's reducing the trade deficit. I think that's what he wants. And then uh, Kudlow, the, 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 the new um, national economic advisor, 
is kind of the spokesman to settle down the stock markets. That's kind of the, the common view of them. Lighthizer is a hardliner and so is Navarro. Lighthizer is much more professional and informed. And um, Navarro, though, is a very smart agitator. And they look at, they've been looking at um, policies coming out of China for many years that were very detrimental to the U.S. and that nothing was being done about them because the companies would push back saying, you're going to hurt my profits this quarter. And that doesn't work anymore. They're, they're kind of fed up. They're actually calling out some large American companies for not being patriotic. If Lighthizer has the lead, um, you, we, 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 this you know, could be very tough action. Um, I think that the uh, Commerce Secretary Ross is not really a player in, in trade right now. He wasn't even agreed to put on the mission until Sunday before they came. Um, and when they were here, when Trump was here, and they had the discussions of the economic dialogue that, that actually Ross had led, um, he wasn't in the room. It was Lighthizer doing the discussion. So I think he's been sidelined quite a bit on trade. They might want to try to do a reform that would be, would be good for the other guy um, as much as China. If you look at the reforms they're doing, they're based at helping China where it needs help. In financial reforms, China's already got these major companies that own the market, but they're not as professional as they should be. You let the foreigners come in more and they help clean up the system. On automobiles, um, China needs electric vehicle technology from elsewhere, so you've got to let the foreigners in. On pharma, they've made some quite good changes on, on um, being able to take drug trials from overseas and use that data here for passing them and, and making the reviews and the approvals much quicker. But part, that's because the Chinese people are very unhappy with their healthcare system, but that's a good thing. Um, I think really um, there would have to be some very serious reforms on where American companies have real strengths. How about allowing law firms here to do real law? How about allowing the Chinese lawyers in American law firms here to actually keep their legal license when you've got the Chinese firms going overseas? Um, the same thing on open, really opening payments, um, you know, uh, more and more services, um, all of that. I mean, there's, you know, there's so many industries that are either blocked officially or blocked through a regulatory process here. Uh, they need to show some real opening. This is a, a moment that we need significant change. A little, a little papering over of, of some trade numbers and then moving on is not where this is going to end. Um, it's too important. China's too powerful. And, uh, and when we went to the Chinese embassy in Washington, they were using the old narrative that America's rich and China's poor and it's unfair to push like this and, um, and that China 2025 is aspirational, but it's not really... Um, that important and um, um, we all know better you know you can't use those old arguments and, and try to move things ahead you know you gotta you gotta change the way you uh, you gotta change your um, rhetoric to go with the change of where you are in the world China is a global power a very powerful economic um, and, and political power around the world and um, so people are viewing it differently Europe and America and Japan Korea, um, you know, who suffered all the uh, difficulties after the THAAD missiles. Um, so it's, it's a new day, new day and you've got to acknowledge it.